All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And tonight I want to talk to you about the great confession. The great confession. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just thank you for your many blessings. And God, I just thank you, Lord, that uh, you are with us. I thank you, Lord, that uh, just the rain and the cooler weather and the break, uh, Lord, is just a wonderful thing. Uh, Lord, even as I drove in this morning, uh, the guys were starting to scrape off uh, grass, getting our parking lot ready to be done. And Lord, just seeing your progress and seeing your work done here is just thrilling. And God, we just pray that you continue to be with our church and just all the areas. Uh, God, I thank you for all of our staff, and I thank you uh, especially for our volunteers. We have so many volunteers uh, that help us, and uh, God, I just thank you. It, it's just an honor and a privilege uh, to, to lead uh, this group of people, and God, we just love you. I ask you just to be at the Bible study tonight and our prayer time afterwards. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, if you look at your handout, if you want a handout, uh, they're back there for you. I want to talk to you tonight about the great confession. Number one, the test. The test. Don't you like test? Anybody like test? Okay, some people are, I'm, I'm getting a yes and a no from folks. Number two, the answer. Do you know, and I know you know this, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Do you know there's an answer to every problem in life? God has an answer to every problem that you have in life. And, uh, <laughs> Let me give you a hint here. Jesus is the answer. Okay? No matter what's going on in your life, Jesus is the answer. Number three, the church. The church. So, in our text, Jesus took his disciples into Gentile territory in the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi. That was 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee, and it was 120 miles north of Jerusalem. And being in the northern part of Palestine, uh, there were many pagan religions that Baal was the idol that most people worshipped in that region. Uh, there, were a, a, there were also a lot of Greek culture and shrines mixed with uh, pagan superstitions. Jesus loved to use the objects around him to teach the Pharisees and the Sadducees some extremely important spiritual lessons. Jesus' main purpose in his three and a half years with the disciples was to prepare them for true ministry after he left earth. This text was a high point in the life of Peter and the disciples. Jesus was one of the greatest disciples ever to walk and live on earth. Let's look at this extremely important question Jesus asked his disciples. So let's look at the test. The test, verse 13. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? And, you know, it wasn't that Jesus was inquisitive, all right, because Jesus knows everything, okay? He wanted to hear their answer, okay? He wasn't fishing for compliments or anything like that. He was wanting to know, and and again, you know, this is a test, and, you know, to, to find out where they are. Uh, the disciples had already been with him in certain situations in life. Uh, this was probably about three-fourths of the way through his ministry. And so he just uh, come to a point to where uh, he needed to find out, uh, you know, what they knew and what they uh, could remember. And when you look at this, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, the Son of Man and the Son of Man is used 80 times in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. Uh, it is used many times in there. Uh, and then verse 14. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And of course, you know, <laughs> I always <laughs> like multiple choice questions much better than completion questions, all right? And here, it was almost a multiple choice question. And, uh, you know, the reason some of these, like John the Baptist, 
He was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Uh, matter of fact, you know, there were some, some you know, that thought, uh, you, know, you know, he was one of the greatest preachers uh, in uh, these biblical times. And then they mentioned Elijah. Uh, Elijah was probably the most popular and most well-known uh, prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, there was even, uh, I was reading in, in one commentary that uh, they thought maybe he reincarnated this man. <laughs> Uh, was reincarnated Elijah, and of course we know that's that's crazy. Uh, others was Jeremiah, and we know Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. And uh, you know, if you remember the text, uh, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept. Uh, that may be where they got that, or one of the prophets. And you know, people get confused over who Jesus is. Uh, when I'm in a witnessing situation, you can't assume anymore that everyone knows who Jesus is. You just can't assume that, all right? Uh, and, and, you know, you have to really guard against that, and you have to listen, and you have to uh, qualify and, and know uh, where you are in that situation. But there are many opinions about uh, who uh, people thought Jesus was, and, you know, we have this thing called opinion polls, okay? And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't trust opinion polls, all right? And I think even at that, modern-day times, uh, Jesus wasn't concerned about that. What really matters, and, and folks, it really doesn't matter what people think or who th- they think Jesus is. What really matters is who he is. And to know who Jesus is, Folks, we have to have the Word of God. I mean, Jesus is in every book, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, you can find Jesus all the way through there. And uh, again, Jesus had taken time to teach them, and you know, he taught in parables. He, he, you know, uh, the other thing, you know, how would you not believe that he was if you were around him? How could you not believe he was not the Messiah? Think of the miracles that he had done. And so you knew, I mean, if you were around him very long, you know, uh, I, I think of the feeding of 5,000, just one. I think uh, two or three different times they were on the Sea of Galilee or they were on a sea and, you know, uh, the storms came. And uh, folks, that, that's who Jesus was. I mean, to be there and rocking along and water falling in and waves coming over there, and all he simply did was stood up and said, peace, be still. So... He had already proven to who he was to them, okay? But he was making a point here, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that point in just a few minutes. And we, people, people need to know who Jesus is. We, we need to be introducing people to Jesus, all right? Because, I mean, Jesus was a common name in those days, uh, and, and, you know, there, there could have been all kinds of Jesuses is what I'm getting at. Hold your finger there and go to John chapter, 1 John 4 with me. 1 John 4. And John here is writing, and listen to what he says. Beloved, okay, and beloved is to other Christians, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Folks, anybody can say they are of God. Anybody on TV, you can buy a suit or whatever you do, you can buy time, but that doesn't mean that you are a man or a person of God because many false prophets have gone out into this world. And through our history, uh, folks, we have seen false prophets. Uh, you know, Paul and Peter, uh, they battled false prophets in those days. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And again, the virgin birth, you, you, you need to tie that in with who Jesus is. Jesus had human flesh, but I'm telling you, he was 100% God and 100% man. And then it says, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. 
And of all the people in Jesus' days that gave him the hardest time about who he was, who was it? The scribes and the Pharisees. Okay? They did not think Jesus was the Messiah. They would not recognize him for who he was. All right? Uh, they would even use another name. They'd call him the man. or they, they, they didn't even like to say his name. And even in our world, folks, uh, you're going to run into some people uh, that are just anti-Jesus, okay? And, and really, they're anti-God and, and you know, anti-religion. Don't, don't give me that stuff. Verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcame them because, because uh, he who is in you is greater than he is in the world. And so we see here, uh, you know, there's basically two worlds that we have. We have the Jesus world and the spiritual world. Okay, and then we have the world. And again, we're not talking about the earth. We're talking about non-believers. And non-believers do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And it says, they are of the world, therefore they will speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, and he who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so what is the spirit of truth? Jesus was the Son of God. What is the spirit of truth? Jesus was born of a virgin. What is the spirit of truth? And man, I'm telling you, when Jesus said this, you know, uh, you know, they would not associate perfection with Jesus. But folks, I'm telling you, he lived a perfect life. So the test was, first, who do they say I am? And what makes the difference on whether you know who he is or don't know who he is? And folks, that's the thing about the world that we live in now. We live in the spiritual world, okay? And you're, you are going to run into people that do not understand. They want to be able to see somebody. They don't want to read a book. They'll just say, anybody could have written that. You know, I've, I've come up against all kinds of reasons. But folks, Jesus was, was simply emphasizing. Remember, he was getting towards the end. It wasn't the very end, but you know, he, he's probably 75% through uh, his ministry, and now he was wanting to find out where they are and what they were thinking. So the test. And then let's look in verse 15. Let's look at uh, the scripture here. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? The most important word in that verse is you, okay? Who do you say that I am? It's not a blanket decision. It's not a one-size-fit-all thing, okay? It's individually. He was talking to his disciples. And folks, I am telling you, this is probably the most important question that you can ask someone. Who do you say Jesus is? And folks, in, in the witnessing situations, that is vital, okay? That is vital. And so he was waiting to give an answer. And, you know, verse 16, I don't think any of us are surprised who answers the question. All right? It's always Peter. Peter, Peter always had an opinion. Peter was kind of at the forefront of the disciples. He's, he was the spokesperson. Okay? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did Peter do? He just made an A on the test. Okay, he just made an A. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and again, Jesus tried to tell them over and over, and even in his teachings, he said, I and my Father are one. Okay, and, and I'm telling you, the scribes and the Pharisees, they just go, they go bonkers over that. They just, they just did not believe that in any form or fashion. And of course, you know, Christ uh, in the Old Testament was the coming Messiah. Uh, he was the anointed one. There, there are just so many names uh, that we had for Jesus. And then it says there that uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And here, the word blessed is Peter was blessed because he knew who Jesus was personally. I was thinking when I was looking at this on Monday, I, I just, you know, to be able to be around Jesus, just, just put yourself in Peter's place. And just to be around Jesus and to listen to him talk and to hear him teach and to watch what happened. Folks, I am telling you, knowing Jesus changes your life. And, and I'm working on a sermon now. I may preach it next Wednesday night. Everyone uses this, this, this phrase, seeing is believing. But the title of my sermon is, Believing is seeing. Okay? They did both. They saw what he did, but they realized the world that Jesus lived in and that that was a kingdom not of this earth. Because the disciples thought, and, and most people thought, you know, the disciples and, and, and other Christians thought he was going to come and he was going to co- conquer the Romans and take over. And folks, that's not what he was about, okay? He was about who he was and what he did and why he came to earth. And folks, that was to die on a cross for our sins. So he is praising Peter at this time uh, for him understanding. And he is even giving that. When he said, uh, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. God himself gave this to you. And when you think about that, I mean, you know, we, we do. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us as Christians. But to, to realize what he was saying, he was simply saying, I sent Jesus. Jesus is part of me. We all three, you know, and he didn't get into the Trinity or anything like that, but I'm just telling you, he was made, Jesus was making a statement to Peter. Peter, you get it. You get it. Uh, Acts chapter 4. Look at Acts 4, if you would, with me. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. This is Peter later on preaching. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's the key, said to them, you rulers of the people and of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed been done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, then let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and notice he put, you know, because like I said, there were many Jesuses. That name was a common name in those days. And they wanted to identify, they wanted him to know, these folks to know for sure, it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you, is whole. And I just go back from there to what that preparation was. Folks, Jesus was using that time of preparation and that testing because Jesus knew, hey, later on, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be able to encourage you guys. All right, I'm not going to be beside you. I'm not going to be the one doing the preaching. And so he was literally preparing Peter and those disciples for future ministry. And it all started, this, this is, is the first time Peter makes that statement, and that statement, uh, you know, it just, it, it just resounds. It just, it just goes out. It's, it's one of those aha, wow moments, okay? And, and Jesus was just, just growing these, these men and was teaching them uh, who he was and what he was about. Why? Because they literally, the Acts chapter 2, the, the first uh, New Testament church, they were li- literally taking over Jesus' ministry. And folks, to lead, I'm just telling you, you have to know Jesus Christ. To be anointed, you have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. To be the kind of Christian you need to be, you have to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. And so he tells them, you are the one that crucified Christ. In verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And that's what he is saying. He says, 
You know, the ones that the one that you rejected. He was here. He lived a perfect life. He he preached to you guys. He tried to tell you, uh, you know, who he was and what he was about. But you rejected him. And folks, when you think of cornerstone, it's that first stone that lays that is laid and makes the the house in in the building. It everything is set by that, folks. Jesus is everything to us. He is everything. And then it says, for there's uh, nor there is salvation any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. So, bottom line is, folks, you got to come through Jesus. If you want to be saved, you got to come through Jesus. And this, this all started at this point, you know, that we were reading about. Hey, here's the test. Peter passed the test with flying colors. And he became what we know is the leader of the apostles uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. First uh, John, First John thirty. No, excuse me, John one, not First John. John chapter one. John chapter one. Verse thirty-five. And again, the next day, John stood with two of the disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, and he said, "Behold, the Lamb." Of God. How would he have known that? How would he have known that? Folks, it's the Spirit of God. I'm just telling you, if Jesus walked in here tonight, I promise you, you would know who he was. Okay? He wouldn't even have to walk in and say, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm just telling you, you would know it. Why? Because your spirit would bear witness with him. Because you, and, and I don't know about you guys, but I, I just can't wait. I, I just want to see, you see all these pictures of who Jesus is? you know, supposed to look like, I have no idea what he's going to look. I, I just, I just want to see face to face uh, what he looks like. And it says, uh, and it says, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, he said, what do you seek? And they said to him, rabbi, which is to say, teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. And they come and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about the tenth hour, and one of the two heard, who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Think about that, folks. Peter, was, Peter and Paul were the main two folks in the New Testament. That, I mean, it just, they just take over uh, of the New Testament. All right. I mean, Peter starts out in Acts chapter two, and then John, I mean, Paul does does the rest in, in all of Paul's writing. But yet, in this stri- scripture, who brought Peter to Christ? His brother. And when we think of the disciples, I mean, we know he's listed and all that stuff. But I'm just simply saying, I'm just telling you, folks, it is so important. It is so important for us to share the gospel with others. When we have found the Messiah, uh, I mean, I think of a modern day example, somebody had to lead J. Harold Smith to Christ. Somebody had to lead Billy Graham to Christ. And when we are leading people to Christ, you have no idea, no idea about who, you know, about, you know, what God has for that person. I shared with you, I think it was last week that I'm going home and I'm going to Cameron Baptist Church and they're having a reunion there. It's their 100th birthday or celebration of there. and I'm kicking it off on a Wednesday night. And three of the five preachers came out that will be speaking there came out of my youth group. Three of the five. So you, you just, you never know when you're a youth minister or you're just a lay person leading somebody to Christ. You never know the potential that they have there. You know, and, and, and so I, I just think that's awesome. And, and it says, and, and Jesus looked at him and he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, a translated stone. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then John chapter 8. John 8, verse 32. John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What is the truth? Folks, the truth is Jesus. 
What is the truth? The Word of God. I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is all of that. Oh, we got the answer. What would make our world better? Jesus. What could straighten us out? Jesus. What do, who, who, who do people need? They need Jesus. That's why I said Jesus really is the answer to all the problems in life. Then look at verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I hope you live and feel like a free man or a free woman. And you think about it, folks. We really should have no worries or no troubles. Why? And what do people think the worst thing that can happen to them? It's death. <laughs> but you know what? That is the best thing that can happen to a Christian. I am free. I am free. I will go to the place God prepared for me. And then uh, look in verse 42, and Jesus said of them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father, uh, you want to do. He was a murderer in a begin uh, from the beginning and does not stand for the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. What is he saying? He's saying, folks, there's two forces that is working in the world. You've got the spirit of truth, which is of the Son of God and, and of Jesus. And you've got Satan. And these, these worlds just clash all the time, all right? And we need to speak the truth to the world. Folks, I believe with all my heart, time is of essence right now. I believe with all my heart I can say this, that if we don't do something now, now for Jesus, it's going to be eternally too late. And so Jesus takes this teaching moment and was preparing them for ministry. The test the answer in the church. And then Jesus ties it into the church. Look at verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades. And that's what made me, I, I quoted this last Wednesday, it made me think of the story, and I said, well, I'm, I'm just going to develop that. And the, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Folks, uh, he wasn't saying, I mean, there, there are religions that deify Peter. Okay, and you just got to read about Peter to know that that man wasn't perfect. Okay, I can relate to Peter, all right? Uh, sometimes, you know, in talking, I say it, and as soon as it comes out of my mouth, I'm thinking, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. But he was the leader of the church, and uh, he, he literally was. When you, go, when you look at the book of Acts, everything, I'm, I'm just telling you, he stood up in 3,000 people. Got saved. God used him in a mighty, mighty way. And on this rock, and the rock is not Peter's. There are people that get that mixed up. They're thinking because, because even in the definitions, I went back to the Greek in these, the one he talks about, Petrus, that means stone. Okay, a stone. And then the other one here, he's using, he's literally meaning a rock. And folks, there's a difference between a rock and a stone. Okay, a stone you can throw. All right, he's a little rock, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the rock. He's everything to our church. Uh, he is everything to our doctrine. He is everything. He is the chief cornerstone, says the word of God. Then Jesus gives them some more teaching here. And Jesus says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. All right, what are keys made for? Opening things. What's he talking about? The keys of heaven. Who is the key to heaven, folks? It's Jesus Christ. And what other door? And this is another thing. What, do God, what does God give us? He gives us doors of opportunity. And folks, we, we, we have to understand. We have to understand. Uh, one of the pictures my granny had, and it was a big picture in her living room, was Jesus at the door, and he was on the outside. And there was a knob on the outside. 
okay? Or maybe it was the other way. No, it's the other way around. The knob was on the inside. So the person there had a lantern. Jesus had a lantern. He was looking in, you know, that way. And that person was the one that had to, to uh, unlock the door and let Jesus in. Jesus is not going to kick your door down and make you be saved, is what I'm trying to say. And we have the honor and the privilege to be that, to be that open door where people can get saved. And, and again, Peter, as you've seen, has seen that. And then he says also, and it says, whatever you bind on earth uh, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And again, you know, it's not a direct thing about prayer, but I am telling you folks, prayer changes things. We need to be praying for lost souls. We need to be praying for divine appointments. We need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel with others. But what he really is talking about, he's talking about the divine authority. Okay? He is talking about kind of what what you what what we can do and what we can't do. All right? And there uh, in what he is talking about, he is simply again telling them, you have the key. Okay, you have the key, and that key is Jesus Christ. I'm going on, but you are going to be my spokesperson. Okay, if it is bound on earth, it bound, it, it's, it's the do's and don'ts. Okay, they, he was literally in that point giving Peter and the disciples the authority to do what needed to be done when uh, Jesus left in the starting of that new church. And a lot of it had to do with the will of God. Okay, I mean, we should always be looking at the will of God, folks. What is God's will for our life? Not what God's will is for somebody else. It's like people, they, they still come to me and just say, I don't know God's will for my life. Uh, do you know God's will for my life? I don't know God's will for your life. I will pray for you, and I pray, I'll pray that God uh, shows him your, you know, the, his perfect will for your life. But being in tune with Jesus and uh, being you know, in tune with, with the Word of God and, and seeking God through prayer are ways that we can find uh, the, king, uh, the, uh, the will of God for our lives. And then, again, we know that Jesus died for the church. Uh, the church itself was used, the word church, 114 times in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, again, the gates of hell, uh, you know, is not going to prevail against us. And even in times, it seems like the Christians lose battles. You know, you know we, we lose battles here and there. But I'm telling you, folks, the war has already been won. Jesus is the key. Jesus is going. I mean, we're studying Revelation right now. And the bottom line in all of Re Re Revelation is he's coming back, okay, and he's going to take back. He is going to just take over. Uh, he's going to judge the world. You know, we just started the trumpet judgment. And, and I'm just telling you, folks, uh, you know, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. and uh, you know, uh, we win, <laughs> we've got him, and uh, it's exciting to know that. Verse 20, and he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Why would he make that statement? Because his time had not come yet. Because it almost sounds like he told them not to witness. He didn't tell them not to witness. He just said, hey, don't make a big deal of it right now. You bank this. We still got ministry to do. I still have much I need to do before I go to the cross. And then the last, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. And this is how you know what to do, where to go, who to talk to, in God's perfect will for your life. How do Christians know these things in second corinthians uh, or first corinthians 2 uh, verse 10 but god has revealed them to us through his spirit folks i am telling you i know when god talks to me 
I know when God speaks to me. I know when, when He tells me specific things I need to do. Lots of times He tells me things in quiet time. And again, <laughs> Steve knows this. Uh, I get answers to questions in my shower. I have no idea why. This started years ago. But I'll be showering, just doing my thing, and it's almost, it's almost as if sometimes he tells me in an audible voice. That's how plain and clear it is to me when I'm in the shower. Now, he does it with my Bible in the hand. He does it quite times. But I'm just telling you, if you will listen to his voice, okay, his spirit, where the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Listen to me, church. God's not playing hide and seek with you, okay? He's not saying, find me or catch me if you can. And you have to be laser focused. You have to be in tune with God. You have to be in tune with his word. And I'm not talking about living a perfect life, okay? I'm talking about being confessed up, being confessed up. As a matter of fact, I started Monday getting ready for the Lord's Supper this Sunday. Started Monday. <laughs> Why? Because I got a lot of getting to, ready to do. All right, maybe you don't. But to, to really take in what the Lord's Supper means and to really be right with God, it's going to take more than a prayer, just a prayer Saturday night. Okay, why? Because the Spirit has to work on us, folks. The Spirit has to work on us. For what man knows, of, for what man knows the things of the man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Notice the spirit there is not capitalized. There are many spirits out there. And a lot of them I don't like. Okay? There are some times I don't even have the sound on my TV and something will pop up on a commercial. And I'm telling you, it is so evil, it's not even funny. It's not even. And folks, I'm telling you that stuff. There are times in my life, and, and I really think if Jesus told me to do, there's times that I think in my life, I need to throw that thing out my window, just chunk it out the window. Because there's all kinds, and I'm not telling you not to watch TV. I'm just saying there's two kinds of spirits out there, and both of them want your attention. All right? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You got to be safe, folks. You got to be walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. He I mean, you think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Part of God is in us. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's the third person in the Trinity that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. Listen, folks, the most important question asked was, who do you say that I am? Because all of your eternity depends on that. But we also, once we have that, we need to share who Jesus is with everyone around us. Not everyone knows Jesus. And I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've been in this business 43 years. And there will be a time in a lost person's life where they are extremely susceptible to a gospel presentation. Death, loss of an occupation, Divorce, I can just go through these things. And God allows these things to happen so that we as Christians can say, we do have the answer. Folks, I, I told you when we started, the answer is Jesus. And I'm telling you, Peter got it. Peter, in, in all his faults and things, denying Christ three times, bonehead, bonehead, bonehead. He, God, used him in a mighty, mighty way. Father, I thank you for the great confession, and really it's just a profession. And God, I thank you for salvation. But God, that doesn't end. That just begins our walk with you. And God, uh, uh, I know we don't have Jesus walking beside us. We, don't, we can't witness what he is doing. But God, we've read about him. We've read it in the word. We believe. We know it's true. And God, I pray that we would apply all Scripture to our lives. And God, I pray that we would pass the test. I, I would believe with all my heart everyone here tonight is saved. There's, I mean, 
I may be wrong, but I just, I just believe they are. But God, it's more than that. It's getting other folks into the boat. It's sharing the gospel. It's telling people who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in our life. God, everyone, everyone here influences someone. And so, God, I pray that you would just use us. And God, I would pray that we would take the great confession in our profession, in profession of faith. And God, I would pray that we would use it for your honor and your glory. God, thank you for the Spirit of God which is in us, and thank you for the Word of God which is you, which is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. And I thank you that we have these two things as our divine authority and our tools as we witness to others about you. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.